We don't have to read the four accounts of the gospel very long before we see that Jesus was the master storyteller. On the occasion that we're going to look at this morning, there was a multitude of thousands and they were gathered and there was a man in the crowd that told Jesus to tell his brother to divide the inheritance with him. And in Luke chapter 12, this is Jesus' response to that man's demand. In Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 14, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops, so he said, I'll do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you've provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Greed or covetousness is the desire for the wrong things. It's the desire to gain worldly possessions for their own sake, not to help others. Paul told Timothy to warn the people that he was with about the same danger. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul leaves these instructions to Timothy to tell those that he would be preaching to. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Verse 9, Paul says this, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There was nothing wrong with the possession of wealth. It was the wrong use of it that Jesus is here condemning. Wealth and possessions can lead one away from God and into ruin. And therein lies the danger. The wise man in Proverbs 15, verse 27, talks about the danger of greed. In Proverbs 15, verse 27, the wise man said, He who is greedy for gain troubles his own house. But he who hates bribes will live. Greedy for gain. This is a person that covets gain. And it's just for himself. See, greed is all about yourself. It's not about the desire to have more, to help more. It's the desire to have more for yourself. And Jesus condemns it. Paul condemns it. James condemns it. In James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, James gives this warning about greed and covetousness. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You've lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You fatten your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. There's the one again who's only concerned about fattening his own heart. So it's not about gaining more, but it's about gaining more for yourself. Selfishness therein is is the real root of the problem for what Jesus is talking about, for what Paul is talking about, what James is talking about. Selfishness. Thinking about yourself and not others. The Bible records example after example after example of people who were led astray by their greed, by their covetousness. Back in Joshua chapter 6, this, of course, is talking about the time in Israel's history when they are uh, conquering Canaan. 
And in one of the first places they go, we read about this in Joshua chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in about verse 15. Joshua chapter 6, verse 15. But it came to pass on the seventh day <clears throat> that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. It's, of course, talking about Jericho. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction in it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. Now listen to verse 18. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Warning, do not take of those things God has called accursed. Don't touch them. Don't take them. Leave them alone. That is a direct command from God. Well, notice Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Here we have Achan, who didn't want to leave those accursed things alone. His greed got the best of him. And so instead of destroying them, he took them instead, and the Lord was angry. When Israel attacked Ai, the next city on the, the list of those cities that they were going to destroy, the Israelites were routed by the men of Ai. They lost big time. This is what God tells Joshua in the next chapter, beginning in verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Notice what happens to Achan for his greed, for his covetousness. Verse 15. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has because he's transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he's done a disgraceful thing in Israel. He says that's what's going to happen to him. Skip down to verse 19. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I've done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment... 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing, weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent. And there was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And he took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones still there to this day, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. What was his sin? I coveted them and took them. Notice what his greed, his covetousness got him. A lot of other places in the Old Testament. Gehazi, 
2 Kings chapter 5, his greed caused him to lie. And look what it got him. What about Judas? When we read John chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, we read something about Judas. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 4 and following. Notice what it says. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. He couldn't stand that money to be in there and him not take part of it. Greed. Covetousness. And, of course, we know what happened to Judas. Ananias and Sapphira that we studied about in Acts chapter 5. What did they do? They had a piece of land. They decided to sell it, which they didn't have to do. And they gave part of it to the work of the kingdom. But they claimed they gave it all. Greed, covetousness. And of course, we know that they died that very day. That's what greed leads people to, often to death. In Malachi chapter 3, we have some advice, I guess is what we would call it. Maybe we might call it warnings of what greed can do. Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, Malachi is written kind of as a conversation between God's people and God. And God makes some accusations against God's people, and God's people come back and say, how, how did we do this? What are we guilty of? How did this happen? In Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, Yet from the days of your fathers you've gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? See, there's that. Come back. How do we need to come back? What do we do? Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? The answer, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me even this whole nation. They had robbed God by simply not giving God what he was due. You know, at that time they were to tithe, and they weren't tithing all that they were supposed to. They were keeping part of it back. So greed and covetousness and selfishness can cause people to rob God of what he is due. The Bible says it chokes the word of God out of people's hearts. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus reveals this in verse 22. Of course, this is about the parable of the sower. In Matthew 13, verse 22, Jesus says, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches... Choke the word. See, riches can be deceitful. They're not bad in and of themselves, just like no material thing is, is bad in and of itself. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. And that's what he is warning about here. He says riches can deceive you. And the deceitfulness can actually choke the word of God from you. You can allow greed and covetousness and selfishness to choke God's Word. In other words, it keeps you from doing what God's Word says. Greed, selfishness, covetousness can keep you from helping those who are in need. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this. 1 John chapter 3 verse 17 John says, but whoever has this world's goods, possessions, money, whatever, and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's rhetorical. It does not. It doesn't abide in him. 
So again, greed, selfishness, it's all about me. It's all about me, that selfishness. And that's what greed is. All about you. That can keep you from doing what's right, whatever that is. Causes men to stray from the faith over and over. We saw that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Cause people to stray from the faith. It causes them to be pierced through with many sorrows. And just think about the people in the world that we know and see, people on TV or whatever, that that happens to. That this inordinate lust, this inordinate desire to have more just for themselves causes sorrow after sorrow after sorrow. Think about how many divorces happen because of selfishness and greed. Over and over and over again, divorces happen because of financial reasons. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're given some rather disturbing news from Paul's pen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9 of that chapter, notice what Paul says. Again, kind of disturbing words. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous. You read that? nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Some of the Corinthian Christians had been people who were guilty of coveting. But they had done something about it. Were, past tense. They weren't coveters anymore. They weren't greedy anymore. They weren't selfish anymore. Now that's a list of some Individuals that we wouldn't want to be classified with. Fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, drunkards, extortioners. Those who covet. So how do we overcome it? Remember the disciples' prayer? It's found in at least two places in the New Testament. What does Jesus tell his followers, his disciples to do? Pray that you will not be led into temptation. Luke 11, verse 4. Pray that you will not be led into temptation. That's a proper prayer. Pray that I will not be tempted to covet, to be greedy, to be selfish. Give generously to the Lord's church. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Beginning in verse 1, what Paul tells the church at Corinth to do. He says in verse 1 of the 8th chapter, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Then in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Freely willing, liberality, generous, and yet they were in deep poverty. Not just poverty, deep poverty. That's a lot of poverty. When you're in deep poverty, that's a lot of poverty. But yet they were able to, according to Paul, give greatly. Not just according to their ability, but beyond it. There's a way to overcome greed and selfishness and covetousness. Verse 7 of that same chapter. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. See, he says, look at the churches of Macedonia. They're way poorer than you. And yet they were very generous. They weren't greedy. So he's telling the church at Corinth, don't be greedy. Don't covet. Look at these other churches and see what they have done. And you need to abound in giving as well. Chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, 
down in verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you've sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you're enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. He says that's how to overcome it right there. That's how you overcome it. As Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. Whether it's, if I'm rich, I can be content with that. If I'm poor, I can be content with that. So it wasn't the amount that Paul had. He says the amount didn't have anything to do with it. He said it was my attitude toward my amount that was important. It was great that there were many people who had an abundance in the first century so they could help Paul on his mission work. He was thankful for all the people, individuals and congregations, who had the resources to help him on his mission work. He was very thankful for it. But Paul also knew that he needed to be content regardless of whether there were people supporting him or not. Because sometimes he did what? Went to work as a tent maker. Sometimes he took the support. Sometimes he worked as a tent maker. But either way, he says what's important is not how much you have, whether it's vast amounts or practically nothing. He says view it so that you can have the right attitude. Now, the Bible never condemns being rich, nor does it ever promote being in poverty. The Bible never condemns how much you have, but it's about how you view it. It's how you view it. Are your riches an end in itself? The parable of the rich fool, that's what his problem was. His riches, his possessions, that was his life. That's all he cared about. Didn't care about spiritual things, didn't care about doing the right thing, didn't care about helping other people, and certainly wasn't thinking about the next life. See, that was his problem. His riches and possessions, they were an end in itself. That's all he was concerned about. He said what he should have been concerned about is doing something good with them. The more riches, the better if you're going to do something good with them. Because he says, this is how one is rich toward God, helping other people. And that's how he ended that parable. If you want to be rich toward God, remember that it's not how much you have, it's what you do with it. It's what you do with it. That's what's important. It's kind of like what we do with God's Word. We have it. It's a great possession, but we have to use it. We have to use it. We have to open it. We have to study it. We have to learn from it. We have to put it into our lives. And then it becomes even more valuable. But if we never open it, it's never going to help us be rich toward God. Whether it's about becoming a Christian, you know, having our sins washed away in baptism, or if it's about uh, continuing to confess our wrongs or whatever... We must open God's Word and use it. What are we doing with God's Word? So this morning, David's chosen an invitation song to help us think about our lives. And if there is a need, to respond to that invitation. Let us stand and sing this song. <laughs>